win the results war, don't fight theoretical battles. I hadn't planned on shooting this video, and I'm going to wing it right off the top of my head, but I read this thing on Twitter this morning. Satya Malik, who I, I follow on Twitter, talked about Jan LeCun from NYU, who's a, you know, a pioneer in artificial intelligence and machine learning. And uh, he, he, re he quoted a tweet from Jan LeCun that, where Jan said, you know, I don't engage in vacuous debates, nor do I speculate about vague hypothetical proposals. I build stuff. You should try it sometimes. It's okay. And he basically, he was in this argument with this guy, Gary Marcus, where Gary wanted to engage in, in, a, in a theoretical battle about the semantics you know, the, the underlying details in artificial intelligence, deep learning and machine and machine learning. Right. And basically what he said was he had posted a video of a, um, a, a Tesla in full self-driving mode. Someone was using a Tesla with the summon feature. And if you haven't used the summon feature in a Tesla, basically if you have full self-driving, uh, you could be like in a mall and you could come out of the mall and instead of walking to your car, you could summon your vehicle. Okay. And basically you go to summon, you draw a little, or you drag a little bullseye to where you want the car to drive to. And then you basically hold down a button to tell the car to drive and it drives by itself to that spot. Now there's a whole bunch of stuff going on in there. It drives really slow. Uh, uses the turn signals and stuff, which is kind of cool. Um, but what happens is, is first the app makes sure that it can drive to the location where you want to go. And if not, you can't even start full self-driving, number one. And number two, while it is driving, if there are any obstructions, a car pulls out or whatever, it'll stop. It'll wait for that obstruction to clear. If the obstruction doesn't clear, you're going to have to go to the car, Okay. So the video that he posted was basically of a, a jet, or I think it was a prop plane. And the prop plane was kind of spinning around, like on one wheel. You know, it was basically one, like one engine was on and it was spinning around real slow. And the owner of the plane had summoned his Tesla. And the Tesla literally drove into the, the back of the plane. Um, the, I don't know what that's called. It's where the air aliens are and the, and the rudder is. It's off the ground. There's nothing on the ground. It's, it's literally off the ground. It would be like a uh, Tesla drove its windshield into it. Right. And, uh, in this space, Gary Marcus guy wanted to fight with Jan about blah, blah, blah. You know, this is, this is the problem with AI, blah, blah, blah. Okay. Anyway, Gary Marcus was just going back and forth, having a theoretical argument about AI and machine learning. And Jan said, listen, this is pointless. It's a vacuous debate. I operate in the results space. Now, what Jan didn't say and what he should have said, and Jan, I think, was a... Gary, I think, was with Uber originally. And, you know, I mean, they're both, like, super accomplished guys in the space. But Gary wanted to debate this whole... He wanted to have a theoretical debate on the implementation of artificial intelligence used for full self-driving at Tesla. And Jan said, no, I'm not going to have that debate. I'm, we're just going to go. I'm going to take a look and see what the issue is, right? When I worked at Newcore Steel, if you've never worked in a steel mill, okay, in a rolling mill specifically, steel is a really dangerous job. Like, it's not what you see on TV, you know, what, you know, they're forging steel. That's not what we did. We had an electric arc furnace that melted scrap metal into molt, and then it basically casted it into billets that were four inches by four inches, okay? And they were really long, 30 to 45 feet long. And then you would put them in a, in a um, storage area, you'd let them cool down, and then when you were ready to use them, you would uh, put them in a reheat furnace, you'd heat them all the way back up to 1,500, 1,800 degrees, and then you would uh, run them through a rolling mill where you would reduce them down into their finished product. So we made things like rebar, right? Well, that means at the beginning of the rolling mill process, that billet is moving really, really slow, right? It looks like it's just barely moving along. But as you reduce that four by four inch billet down into rebar that's only, you know, three quarters of an inch in diameter, 
and it's triple strand, that shit's hauling ass. It's flying. And you're basically passing that hot steel from one stand to the next. So as things wear, you basically get these horrible crashes, right? And the hot steel would go flying everywhere and it could kill somebody and it has killed people. So what I couldn't believe was that we, A, we didn't have any cameras set up so that we could diagnose visually what actually happened. Like, could we predict when a crash was gonna happen? And we also didn't collect historically any of the data from the rolling mill stands through the ABB DCS that controlled the rolling mill. Now, if I wanted to do that, if I was gonna get permission to try and predict crashes, which would kill someone, you know, I'm, a, I'm just an electrical technician at this point. I serve a role in the controls engineering department, but I, my title is electrical technician, two or whatever, or senior or whatever it was. You're not gonna give me hundreds of thousands of dollars to do this project. I'd spend years trying to make that case and I'd never get the money, ever. So what did I do? I said, well, what are the building blocks of the things that I need? Okay, well, I need a camera so that I can, the camera can tell me what my failure was. And basically all I needed was a camera that had area recognition. I could create an alarm off of a trigger. If I ever see the rebar in this area of the image, that means we had a crash, okay? I needed that event. And then the other thing was I needed to be able to view current through the stand. I needed to be able to view uh, speed. I needed to be able to use all the process control variables. So I called the local Wonderware rep. We didn't have a historian. I called the local Wonderware rep. Shout out to Joe Stanzik, who was at a company called Cumation at the time, based in Horsham, Pennsylvania. Joe and I have a relationship to this day, and this is fucking 20-something years ago. I said, hey, Joe, I got this idea. Would you mind, you know, I didn't know who he was at the time. I called and I found out who the rep was and I invited him to Nucor Steel and he came and he visited me and I said, listen, people I work with, they're not down with this, man. It's just me. I need your help. Can you get me some licenses? So, and can you get me licenses for like six months to a year so I could do this, so I could just test this. I need to collect all this data. I need to build some visualizations and I don't have any money for it. But if I do what I do right, if I do what I know I can do, you're gonna get paid. And he said, sure, let's do it. So I got licenses. He, I think even, actually, my company paid for the training. So then I went and got, you know, certified in Wonderware, right? So that I knew how to work with the platform. I hooked up the historian, I started collecting all the data. I took my tool budget, okay, so I, I got 11, $1,100 a year, I think, to buy tools. So I took all $1,100 and I bought cameras. Okay, I bought cameras with a DVR and they were all PoE, power over ethernet, so I didn't have to run any big infrastructure. And I installed the cameras on my downtime. Like when I, I installed the cameras when I didn't have anything else to do. I worked on the historian when I didn't have anything to do. And everyone kind of in my department kind of knew I was doing something but they didn't know what I was doing. And then I just waited. And I waited for every crash and I would go and analyze the data and I started dabbling with TensorFlow with doing uh, machine learning and there, the machine learning was really in its infancy at this time. And everything was like beta and it was all, I was doing it on um, IRC chats and I built a visualization that tried to predict failure. And I wrote, I ended up writing my own algorithm. Okay. And it was basically a function of current fluctuations in the stand. And I think it was stand 13 or 14, which was one of the finishing stands in the rolling mill. And I looked at current fluctuation. Um, and I looked and I was monitoring a vibration sensor. So there was also a vibration sensor on the, I can't remember what they called that box, but there was a box where the steel fed into. I was able to predict when we'd have a crash. And all I did was I took, I, uh, we had a major crash running triple, we're running triple stand steel. And I actually have this video to this day and I, maybe I'll share it. Who cares? It's the worst thing you're going to do. Triple strand. We're running triple stand strand 
and there was a guy, and I, I was able to show, a guy was nearly killed. Five, a five, it was a five second different. I'll show you. The guy walks up, they used to walk up with these sticks. We had an electronic profile gauge, but the way that they would look to see if the steel was being manufactured correctly, reduced correctly, is they'd go up with a stick and they'd let that stick get burned on the hot steel. And then they'd look and they'd look to see that the profile looked right. And in this video, the, the production guy walks up, you know, and there are rules in rolling mills. You never turn your back to the steel. So you always, you're always facing the, the rolling mill. So you never walk with your back against the steel in case there was a crash and you know, that hot steel would, you know, run into you. He literally walked up, he sticked it. It was called sticking. He'd sticked it. He turned, he took three steps away and boom, from that exact same location he was in crash. And had he been in there, he would have been killed just like that. I mean, we're talking a three second window. So I was able to use that video plus the visualizations I built plus the analytics tool I built using all free software that I got to get the funding to do cameras in the entire facility. So, so the full ground plus Wonderware implementation for the entire facility. If I, let's say I tried to fight the theoretical battle. I tried to make my case. It would have never happened. Okay. I would have gotten angry. I would have felt like I was not being listened to. I would have gotten disenchanted and we would have never implemented the solution. Why? Because in organizations that big, this is Parnell's iron law of bureaucracy. In organizations that big, it's not my job to come up with that solution. It's someone else's job. Companies thrive when you have transformative leadership at the top and you have a clear vision, clear mission that's articulated to everyone in the organization. And then you innate, you hire the right people and you enable them to solve problems. Every person, you don't define, you don't tell people which problems are theirs to solve. You tell everyone, every problem is everyone's solution to come up with, right? I learned young, I learned at an early age, don't fight theoretical battles, win the results war. People can't argue with results. They can't argue with results, okay? So if you are struggling to get traction in Industry 4.0, if you're struggling to find purpose with your employer, if you're struggling to get approval to solve some problem, you're the problem not the organization. Large organizations, they're going to operate the way they operate. You have to change the way you approach solving problems. So don't fight theoretical battles, win the results wars. I promise you that is the path. That is the path to progress. Okay. All right. Hopefully this was a valuable video. I, I had no intentions of shooting. It. it was like, I read that thing this morning. Um, and, uh, you know, I read that thing on Twitter this morning, and that ultimately is why I decided to have this conversation. So if it was valuable, uh, please like and subscribe. Um, share the video with somebody who thinks it might be valuable. I think this one will get shared a lot. Um, and um, please comment down below. That really helps the algorithm. The comments are the biggest thing. Um, if you comment down below, it really it has a huge impact on our, our ability to get our message out. So... I will call it a day and I'll see you in the next one.